All right, I'm going to talk about images. There's no sound in my presentation, so. <laughs> um, but I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, but I've been traveling with my family around Europe for a couple of years, and we're in Edinburgh for the next month, so I'm really happy to be able to have a chance to chat with you guys about how to deliver fast and beautiful images. Um, last night, I was here at the Node.js talk talking about video, so if you were there, that's awesome. Today, it's going to be images. Um, the fun thing about traveling around Europe and talking about images, I get to put up cool pictures of places I've been. This is Three Castle Head in southwest Ireland. You drive down this road that says no buses because if it was a bus, it would never get back. And you keep going, and then you walk through like four sheep fields, and you end up at this, this really cool place. Um, so a little bit about me, I, I am traveling, I'm a digital nomad, but I'm doing freelance developer relations, talking to developer communities, helping companies figure out how to talk to developer communities and write documentation and blog posts and stuff. And I also do a lot with performance, so I try to help make apps and um, websites run faster. Um, because as we'll find out, slow websites and apps, people don't like them. So I run workshops on how to do, improve your performance on, and do images and improve your video. I wrote a book. If you want the PDF, that's the PDF. And if you ever want to chat about performance, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet. So I'm pretty easy to find. Um, but before we start talking about images, this is in, uh, in the Alps. And how many of you, when you look at this walkway that's nailed into the side of an Alp, you sort of get a little nervous feeling in your stomach thinking about walking across it? All right, I see some hands. I see some nods, right? When we walked across that, my six-year-old decided to jump. So you got this whole rattling effect going on, which was really cool. She was trying to get her older brother, uh, freak out her older brother. But about two years ago, Erickson did a study. And they put sensors on people's heads to measure stress responses to different things. And they found that thinking about standing in a queue actually raised your stress response. And they found that thinking about standing on the edge of a cliff really raised your stress response. But interestingly, they found that a slow mobile experience <laughs> is more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. So that feeling we all had like 90 seconds ago, if you build a slow app or a slow website, that's what your customers are feeling. And if you start thinking about like when people buy things, you go to a mall, it's always happy music, right? It's always really bright lights. It's all really clean. Because when people are happy, they spend more money. But if you're building a service that people are already feeling a little you know, nervous about being there, that's not such a great thing. And there's been a lot of research. So Google found that a three second delay on a mobile website causes 53% of your users to abandon. Another study where they added a half a second delay made customers more frustrated and less engaged. Almost 20 years ago, Amazon and Walmart independently found that 100 milliseconds cost them 1% of revenue. Right? That's a lot of money. For anybody, 1% of revenue is a lot of money. But my favorite stat is 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a <laughs> slow mobile experience. It's a real study. You can read that there's, I've, I've referenced it. Um, so what can we do to speed up the way websites and apps load? Well, if you look at the average website, the average website is 50% images. So if we can optimize the delivery of the images, we can make you know, the total tonnage of our website a lot smaller. So we're, that's what we're going to talk about today. What can we do to optimize images for the web, for mobile, for apps? It all kind of works the same way um, to make them load faster. So this is Porto in Portugal, and this is a beautiful photograph. And I took it with my phone this fall, and it's 7.9 megabytes. It has all this beautiful color, and it's really engaging. And then the next week, I got to give a talk in Oslo, <laughs> right? We're in Edinburgh. We can't really laugh that much. I'm from Seattle originally. Like, we can't really make fun of that. We've seen this, right? We live this on a regular basis. But it's grayscale. So same camera. It's only three and a half megabytes, right? Because it has fewer colors, fewer changes. That compresses a lot better. Of course, if you're trying to create a, um, you know, a tourism guide for your city, you're probably going to use that image and not an image like this one. Um, so it, it just goes to show that you can same image, same number of pixels, you get different compression depending on what sort of contents in the image. But I'm going to walk through the first, at the beginning, the first four simple image optimizations. Do you guys know Lighthouse? A lot of nods, but for those who don't know, it's a tool by Google that basically 
gives you a bunch of suggestions on how to improve the load of your web page on mobile. And you can run it in Chrome DevTools. You can run it in the HTT in, in, um, in web page test, which I'll talk about in a second. But there are four image optimizations that are in there. The image quality, the image format, image sizing, and lazy loading. And you get a score. It's now between 0 and 1. It used to be 0 to 100. They divided by 100. We can handle that, right? Um, but all of those can be recorded inside web page test, which is another great tool for testing web pages. If you haven't checked it out, you should. And the HTTP archive is built on top of web page test. And the HTTP archive crawls one and a half million websites on mobile and on desktop every two weeks and throws it all into a database. And so what it's doing is it's running web page test. So I have Lighthouse data for one and a half million websites. And I can look to see how they're optimizing their images what people can do to make their images run better. So we're going to talk about quality first. And Lighthouse recommends that all images are saved at 85% quality. So like in Photoshop, when you lower the quality, um, you, you're losing pixels, right? So it's not going to look nearly as nice. Um, but 85% in general works for most images. And so you can use stuff like Image Magic to save it at 85. You can use Cloudinary. This is a, a, a a cloud platform where you upload the full-size image and you, I just change that parameter to quality 85, Q85, and it generates that image for me on the fly. So what does that look like? I've got this picture right here, 3.6 megabytes. Quality 85, it's half the size, right? 1.87 megabytes. And you can't tell the difference. It's, those actually are different images. Um, so if we look inside the HTTP archive, the Lighthouse data, and this is, this is about a year old, but I don't think it's changed that much. 33% um, fail completely on lowering the quality. These are websites of the 1.2 million websites, 33% completely fail. And if you look at those, Lighthouse gives you an idea of how much faster your page would be and how much data you would save. And that median website, the 50th percentile of failure, would be 2.8 seconds faster to load. Right? That's going to keep your customers around and save you about 420 kilobytes of data. But wouldn't it be cool if we could go better than 85%, right? 85% is just like Google found a thing that works for most images. Uh, there's 50%. And if you look really carefully, there's some kerning and stuff. It's not beautiful. You can really see it at 20%, right? You can see all the bands in the sky, right? It's a horrible looking image. You wouldn't put that on the web except for as an example of a really bad image. Um, but if we start graphing the sizes at the different qualities, we know 20% is bad. We know 85% is good. But where's that spot in the middle? Like, can we do better? And there are actually tools that will do this. Google has a tool called Booter Ugly. Um, all of Google's compression work is done in Switzerland, and they name them all after pastries. <laughs> so Booter Ugly is a type of, I'm the type of person when I go to Switzerland, I go to the market and I take pictures of compression <laughs> in the cookie aisle. Um, you know, we all have our weird are weird uh, things that we do. Uh, the other thing you can do is structural similarity. And what these two tools do is they look for the sweet spot where you lower the, the, the quality enough that the human eye can't tell a difference. So it, it's fine. You could, if you do a structural similarity image, it's going to look great, and the, the human eye can't tell a difference. So there's a CJPEG DSSIM as a tool. Uh, again, Cloudinary can do it. You set to Q Auto, and it generates that image for you on the fly. And we're at 1.46 megabytes. So we saved another 400K from that 85% image. That's pretty good. 400K is probably worth doing. There's the graph. Um, but I put them into web page test. And so web page test actually lets you see how fast they load. I used a 3G connection. I used a Motorola G4 in Virginia. And you can see the load time from the full size image to 85% drops by about 10 seconds. And I save another two seconds going to structural similarity, right? I'm making this page, these images load faster. However, it's still one and a half megabytes. It's still really big. We can go smaller. So I'm going to talk about format next, the different formats you can save images in. Here are the different average sizes from the HTTP archive. JPEGs generally are the biggest. That's also because there are a lot more JPEG images on the internet, right? So it's like there's so many more. There are a lot that are big. There are a lot that are small. Um, Let's talk about vector graphics really quickly. So SVGs are really, really cool. Um, they're drawn as, their images drawn as shapes, and they're infinitely scalable, and they're based on XML. So you get the Twitter logo, 
and you can stretch it to any size you want, and it always looks good because they're just shapes. Um, if you see anything here, it's because PowerPoint doesn't support SVGs, and I had to take screenshots of the SVGs to put them in PowerPoint. Um, but I found this web page that's got this Target logo on it. It's not Target in America. It just has this Target logo. And it was an SVG. And so I was like, well, let's see what's going on with the SVG. And you can open it up. It's XML. And like, these are the three circles that it's drawing right there. But there's this Adobe Illustrator. And um, there was 946 kilobytes of Adobe Illustrator stuff. And there's web pages that show you what to do. But basically what you do is you open up the XML file. You highlight right there. You drag to the bottom and you press delete and you save it. And the image becomes one kilobyte. <laughs> Um, you can gzip it, or you can use Brotly, bread, right? It's a Google compression algorithm. You get it down to 525 bytes. And so, because it's a text file, you can throw that right into your HTML. No big deal. It's, it's half a kilobyte. Um, this web page actually had two of these targets. They had an orange one, too. Um, but what's really cool about SVGs is you can style them. So right here is I just... I created a style where I just changed the color, and I apply that class to it, and it turned orange. So you can do one image download at one kilobyte or 525 bytes, apply the class to the second one, and you're at like less than a kilobyte. Uh, this website chose the two megabyte option, <laughs> <laughs> right, where they downloaded two ginormous files. Um, I guess the moral of that story is if your SVGs are really simple, but they're like hundreds and hundreds of kilobytes, maybe you should look at them and audit them before you push them live to production. I guess that's the moral of the story of this one. Um, I'd like to talk about WebP a little bit too. So WebP is a newer format. It's based on uh, VP8 video. Basically, it's a one-frame video. Um, but it's such a good compression that they made it a separate image format. You can see the average WebP is about half the size of the average JPEG. And when I first wrote this talk about nine months ago, uh, WebP was Chrome and it was Android. That's changed. Just over in the fall, it got added to Firefox. It's in Edge. They're working on it in Safari. Like The support for WebP is getting to be to the point where it makes sense to start using it. It's in a lot of browsers now. And when I take that image that was about 1.4 megabytes and I turn it into a WebP, I save another 400, 500 kilobytes of data, right? It's now under a megabyte. And it loads two and a half seconds faster, right? From 9.4 to seven seconds. And it's about a megabyte in size. When we look at what's happening on the web, most everybody's still just using JPEGs, right? 67% of the web gets a zero for using alternative image formats. Um, but if we go back to that median website, the median website would be 4.1 seconds faster and use 600 kilobytes less data. It's huge potential to speed up your web pages just by changing the format. Um, and now that you've got, you know, you've got Firefox, you've got Edge, and you've got Chrome, it's becoming a lot more viable to do. The third optimization is sizing, resizing the image for the proper device, right? So if I take this image of this cathedral, the original image was 1.6 megabytes. I do all the optimizations we just talked about. I got it to half the size at 800K, but it's still 13 million pixels in size. And so the problem is, if you have a 13 million pixel image and you download onto a mobile device that's that big, the phone downloads all 13 million pixels determines what goes on the screen, and then throws away 12.5 million pixels. So it's sort of like this double taxation, right? You have to download the entire thing and then throw away 95% of the data before it shows up on the screen. And the best analogy I can come up with is like when you order something from Amazon, and there's like eight and a half meters of brown paper in there, and you find out that your kid ordered a pencil. Right? We've all been there, right? That's what we're doing when we do these sorts of things. And to make it worse, you can actually measure in Chrome DevTools um, how long it takes that for that image decode to take. And so on a desktop, it's pretty fast. Like under 100 milliseconds, not a big deal. 
On the Motorola G4, which is sort of a decent mid-range device, we're talking 200 milliseconds. That's perceivable. But um, have you guys heard of the Alcatel One X or Android Go phones? All right, so I see some nods, but Android Go phones are these really low-powered devices. I call them Tesco phones, <laughs> right? They're the phones that you go into Tesco and you're like, oh, you know, you know, toilet paper, paper towels, oh, phones, that's exactly what I needed. You can buy it at Tesco. They're really, really low power devices. They don't have a lot of memory. They have really bad screens. They're the phones, if you go into car phone warehouse, you see the Pixel 3, you see the iPhone, and then there's the phone at the end that isn't plugged in because they don't want you to see how slow it is. <laughs> that's this device, but they're, they're 50 pounds, right? So for a lot of people, that is, gets them a smartphone but it takes 800 milliseconds for that image to get decoded, right? You're adding a whole extra second for the image to show up on the screen. And then you start looking at all the Android devices that are out there. So the size of the box is how many users. So the ones on the left are all like Samsung S8s and S9s. The color is how fast the CPU is. So we got all of these devices out here towards the Android event horizon that are really, really slow and don't have a lot of market share and probably have a different size screen. So what do we do? Responsive images. And so one of the ideas behind responsive images is you create a whole bunch of images that are all 25 kilobytes different in size. Um, and so I did that and now I generated an image and I'm only throwing away 100,000 pixels, right? So I'm not wasting nearly as much data. The new file is somewhere between, you know, 95 and 100 kilobytes. It's really small. There are a lot of tools that allow you to put this right into your, you know, your image processing pipeline. This one's called Responsive Breakpoints. I give it, this is the web interface because it makes for a better screenshot than the, command, than, you know, the terminal. But you can set the, the range of resolutions, how far apart you want them to be, and how many images. And it creates all of those images. Um, and you can build some code that, you don't have to build it like this. You could have this like generate you know, obviously on its own, but these are all different size images for different size screens. But rather than look at the code, I have this as a demo. So let's see if that works. This is the web page. And basically, each image is 25 kilobytes different in size. So when I shrink the size, the image will change. And I've made every other image sepia, so you can tell when the image changes. And let's see if I can get to the corner there. Of course I can because it's still full size, isn't it? Command Shift F. No. Where's the window? What did I do? I broke it. All right. Live demos. All right, here we go. I've got it in its own new window. So we start big, and as we go down, we get smaller. It crashed because I turned off the Wi-Fi. All right, live demos, whatever. <laughs> We're recording the screen for the video through Ethernet, so I don't want to screw that up. But basically, you, you would see that there's a different size image. The biggest one is like 300K, the smallest one's 25K. You get the right size image for the right size device. You kind of, I think you kind of understand it. Um, and of course, when I do that, you know, the image is now properly sized for, it's not 13 million pixels or whatever. It's properly sized for the Motorola G4, so it's 121 kilobytes, and it only takes two seconds to download. Now we're talking about something that's reasonable for a mobile web page, right? Two seconds download, 120 kilobytes. We're getting into that right range. When we look at responsive images from the HTTP archive, most folks are doing this right. 60%, 57% are getting 100%. But, you know, a fifth of the internet isn't doing this. They're not resizing the images for mobile. So probably they're serving the same desktop images to their mobile devices, which obviously is not ideal. And what I found is the median website would be 2.7 seconds faster, 400K smaller. Kind of the same range, but you know, this is a huge way to speed up the delivery of your content. The first three optimizations here are all, what do we do for each image, right? So lazy loading is what can we do to the whole page? And so the idea, I think, Probably a lot of you have heard of lazy loading, but the idea is you've got a bunch of images on the screen. Let's only load the ones that are displayed on the screen. If I don't have to display, download those four images, the page is going to load a lot faster. And then using JavaScript, I can have those appear later when somebody scrolls into place, right? 
Um, if we look, most people are not doing lazy loading. 60% failed the best practice in Lighthouse. And if they did lose, use lazy loading, they would download 500K less content, and the page would load three and a half seconds faster. Again, this is pretty, pretty big way to save data. So if you have an Android device and you use Google image search and you search for cats in costume, if you're on a really slow connection, you'll get something like this. And they have these preview images that pop into place. They populated the whole screen with, I think, basically SVGs that are correspond to the color of the cat that's going to pop into place, right? The dinosaur cat's green, the bunny cat is pink, right? And the idea is those SVGs are really, really small. As a user, you know that an image is coming in place, right? We've sort of been conditioned to know that images are going to come into place there. You get the whole layout, you know the images are coming, and then they pop into place soon after. I think to actually test this, I had to throttle my phone to a slower speed to actually see those um, up here. Um, you can go a step further. There's this really cool uh, GitHub library called Squib, which creates, instead of just a one color SVG, it sort of creates a textured SVG. So instead of the water, instead of just being green, you can sort of see that waterfalls are there. Again, the SVG is under a kilobyte, so you just put it in your HTML as the background image. That loads, and then that pops into place once it's downloaded. So I did a, there are a bunch of experiments out there on lazy loading. This is a giant web page that I built, and I just zoomed it out so you can see all the different screens. It's got a whole bunch of pictures on it. There are a bunch of different viewports. So when the page loads, you're only seeing up to that first line. But when you load it in Chrome, you can see you know, the placeholders are loading in place. At the top of the screen, that image on the right still hasn't loaded by screenshot five, but the cow way down here has loaded completely. So what you'd expect, right, as a customer, the to you, the image, the page hasn't finished loading, but there's all this stuff down here that's already loaded properly, which is sort of not what we'd expect, but we kind of know that that's what browsers do. Um, Chrome is working on this. There's an experiment behind a flag right now that you can turn on, and what it does is it does a request of every image, and it takes the first two kilobytes of every image, and from that, it knows where the images are going to be, and the size of every image, so it can lay out the whole page. You can see the whole page is laid out by number three right here, because it knows the size of every image. It knows where they're going to be. And now that the browser knows where every image is going to be, it can load the images from top to bottom, rather than just in random order on the page. And so you can actually see the images are, loaded, are all completely loaded in screenshot four right here, and then they load down the page as if you were scrolling which makes a lot of sense. So this is really exciting because this is going to be in browsers and take away some of that lazy loading logic that we have to build into our web pages today. Um, so that's what I found from the HTTP archive. I'm going to go into some other image optimization stuff. And for those of you who were here last night, you know who this is. This is Nora, my goat. I was talking about video and animated GIFs are kind of right in the middle. So. This, these are my three slides of overlap, and I apologize to folks who came for two nights. But when you take a video, this video with my phone was 1.4 megabytes, but when I turn it into a GIF, right, there's Nora, and that's, that's Alden behind. He's the furry goat. Um, it's 3.8 megabytes. And because GIFs, when you be, they become animated, they become a lot larger. And if you actually read the spec, the spec says, we have an animated format, but we don't recommend that anybody uses it. It's in the spec. And the reason for that is there's, it's basically a flip book of static images. So if you have a 30 frame per second animated GIF, it has 30 GIFs that it just cycles through every, every second. So what can we do to optimize that is we turn it into a movie. And so what I did is I turned it into a movie. I made it 256 colors. I stripped out the audio track. And it's 93% smaller. I can then just put that into a video tag, loop, autoplay, muted, and it goes. You can play that in the browser, and it looks like an animated GIF to everybody else, but it's super duper small. It's, it's, you'll, we'll see how much smaller it is. Um, video is always the last thing to download because browsers are smart, and they know that video files are ginormous. And so they don't want the video to block the CSS and the JavaScript and all that stuff. Um, <coughs> however, in Safari, you can actually put um, the MP4 in the picture tag. So you can actually put this, the video, so in Safari, it'll play the MP4, Chrome will play the animated WebP, and everybody else gets the animated GIF. 
And why that's really, really cool is the animated GIF takes 22 seconds to download on a 3G connection, but the video only takes four and a half seconds. So for your customers on Safari, if you have that video, it's going to load way faster, and they'll be able to see whatever looping video you want them to see really, really quickly. And you can also see it goes down to 250K, which is really huge. <coughs> now, in addition to all of that, there's stuff that we can do. There are things that our customers are telling us on the web that allow us to modify what the web page is doing. Do you guys know about save Data Saver in Chrome? So inside Chrome, there's a thing that says, turn on Data Saver. And if it's HTTP, it goes through a proxy, and Google will resize all the images for you. Um, but what it also does is it adds a header that says, save data is on. And so now there's this header that's being sent to your server saying, I'm a customer, and don't send me a lot of stuff. So if your customers are saying, don't send me a lot of stuff, maybe you send them smaller images or something like that. And you know, a lot of people didn't think anyone was using this, but uh, this guy is from Belgium, and he does WebPerf, and he found that 5% of his customers actually have this turned on. So if 5% of your users are saying, don't send me giant images and video, maybe we don't have to send them giant images and video. And so there are a lot of examples of what you can do, like if you have the BBC web page, maybe you just cut out a bunch of the images. Right? None of the content's really been lost. You've just removed <coughs> some of the tonnage of the web page. The, I talked about Cloudinary and their Q Auto to automatic quality. If they see that data save is on, they actually lower the quality a little bit more to Q Auto Eco. And in this case, it saves another uh, 45 kilobytes. And so that's just done automatically. They just reduce the quality a little bit more because they've said they don't need the high resolution images, they want the lower quality. Another thing we can use is there's the Network Info API. So what if your customers are on a slow network connection? Do you still want to send them the giant video or the giant images? And so you can actually see there's the navigator connection downlink. And if the JavaScript says that the network connection is only 500 kilobits per second, maybe you hide the video. Maybe you make the hero image a lot smaller. You do things to make the page load quickly on a slow network connection. We've all been to places out in the country where our cell phone has really crappy connection and it's really painful to see the content. Um, <clears throat> and websites like Facebook, the Facebook app will actually hide video if you're in a low connection area because they know the video won't play. So they'll hide all the video posts and show them the next time you come in. So there are a lot of, a lot of people that will do this sort of thing. Another thing that I've seen a lot of people do is base 64 encoding. And so the idea here is you take your image and you encode it base 64, and then you can just paste it right into your HTML or your CSS or your JavaScript. <clears throat> and that's great because you have fewer requests, right? All of the images are in your text files. Unfortunately, the images are now blocking the rendering of your page because your JavaScript file or your CSS just got a lot bigger. Um, when you base 64 encode an image, it gets larger. So you're downloading more content. Um, you can only cache that file. You can't cache the image and the file separately. So if the file changes, you have to download the images again. Um, and they're difficult to reference more than once. Um, so here's a couple examples. Um, I found this university. It's the University of Nebraska. And uh, they have this shared CSS university. It's this template that's used for every department in the university. And it's 91 kilobytes, but 48 kilobytes is an SVG that's base64 encoded. Um, it never appears on any page in the entire website. And I'm like, why the hell does it not appear on any? So I went to their style guide, and it says, if you're part of the University of Nebraska Lincoln, never use this. But use, they have a red N that, they, that you're supposed to use. But they put it on every single page encoded in the CSS file. Right? So every single time someone goes to the, they're downloading. Like, and you could make that file half the size. It would download faster. You'd speed up the delivery of the web page. Right? Sort of common sense. Um, another one that I found is they reuse the same image. So I'm just searching for the base64 code in this CSS file. And there were 16 versions of the same image. In, rather than downloading it once and referring to it 16 times, no, they download this star. Um, 16 times. Now, you may notice that in between where it's not highlighted is the same size. 
And that's because they have an empty star that they request 16 <laughs> times as well in the same CSS file. And so you can imagine this file is just ginormous because they're just requests. Like, don't do that. That's just wasteful. Um, so in conclusion, right, there's a lot of things we can do to optimize the delivery of images over the network. Because if we can make them smaller but still look beautiful, our customers don't know. It just looks faster. So we can change the quality, the format, the sizing. We can lazy load images that aren't on the screen. Um, turn your animated GIFs to movies. I was told last week that if I say animated GIFs, that dates me because all GIFs are now GIFs. Like an animated GIF makes me sound old. So I have to change that slide. Um, don't base 64 encode your images and monitor your customers' headers. If they're saying, don't send me a lot of stuff, don't send them a lot of stuff. I used a lot of tools here, web page test, HTTP archive. Those are the things I did to optimize uh, the images for, uh, for the examples. I'll put the slides up on the Meetup page. So if, feel free to take a picture, but I'll put the slides up too so you can get them later. Um, but in conclusion, you can deliver fast images that look great that your customers don't know anything about. So with that, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. <clears throat>